Racism, xenophobia, intolerance, discrimination, and hate crimes negatively affect many members of different ethnic, religious, or other groups across the OSCE region. However, OSCE participating states have committed to combat all forms of hate crimes, and my office in particular is tasked with assisting the states by providing tools and resources to meet these commitments. Geneva Peacecast, a series on solutions from Geneva Peace Week. Produced by Interpeace and Fondation Hirondelle. Hello, I'm Jackie Dilson, and with us is Christy Edwards, who has more than 20 years' experience in human rights law, gender, international policy, and community development, among other things. And now she specializes in helping governments and civil society to deal with intolerance and hate crimes. And this she does in her role with the Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, part of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Christy, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. First, let's do a quick check in on where things are at in the fight against intolerance, uh, be it racism, racism, xenophobia, discrimination on the basis of gender. On the one hand, I feel like in some areas we've seen really huge advances. So in things like awareness, in legislation, in really putting these issues on the agenda. But at other times, my heart sinks when I turn on the news or look at social media because it also feels like we're going backwards somehow. And I'm just wondering, what's your perception, Christy? You're absolutely correct. Um, my office actually collects the largest data set in the world on hate crime through our annual hate crime report, where we get thousands of reports every year both from governments as well as hate crime incidents that are reported to us by civil society. And this definitely shows that racism, xenophobia, intolerance and discrimination and hate crimes negatively affect many members of different ethnic, religious or other groups across the OSCE region. And so we have a number of programs and tools and resources where we work with governments as well as civil society across the, the region to uh, make sure that they are adequately able to recognize and address these issues. And what do we know about what's at the root of this intolerance and hate crimes in the first place? Well, there's a brilliant scholar uh, and professor, um, Dr. Jen Lindsay, who um, has done some amazing writing about some of the cognitive bias that every individual on the planet has, um, starting from, from when you're an infant, you learn to recognize who is your family, where are you safe, uh, who is your community that's going to protect you. And this is certainly cemented and solidified as you grow older, knowing who to recognize as your in-group and, and who is the other. And so some of the, the studies that have been done over the years have shown that the best way to overcome this, uh, this internal bias is truly to get to know individuals from, quote, other groups, sitting down and having face-to-face -face conversations, sharing a meal, talking about what are your similarities as well as what are your differences, learning, learning about their food, their culture, their language. This is absolutely the best way to get to know uh, other communities and to form those stronger societal and cohesive bonds to create more peaceful societies. And you mentioned earlier that you're working with governments on this issue. What is it that you're doing? We do. We work very closely with uh, many governments across the OSCE region, um, first to uh, help them collect great data. Uh, they provide us annually with uh, data on hate crimes. And so we also uh, work with them to improve their data collection methodology on hate crimes. We also provide capacity building trainings for police and for prosecutors so that they can effectively recognize, investigate, prosecute and record hate crimes, which then helps them to address these issues um, more effectively in their communities. And then finally, uh, we work with civil society organizations frequently providing trainings on uh, coalition building and uh, helping them to work with their governments to better address these issues comprehensively. And for you, were there any particular examples where this has worked really well? Sure. Uh, first, I would say we know that uh, only about 20% of hate crimes are ever actually report, reported to governments. 
And so governments have been doing a lot of work to build community trust, to uh, work on peace building initiatives locally. And so some, some of the places where we've seen this done really effectively have actually been in the United Kingdom. And uh, they've changed the way that they collect data and, and report it internally. Uh, so we actually saw the numbers that they report to us go up, but this is not because the real numbers of hate crime actually changed. It's just because they are now doing a better job of investigating and reporting and recording these numbers themselves. And this gives them a stronger ability to work within their communities to address these issues and hopefully prevent impunity amongst the perpetrators. All 57 states in the OSCE have committed to addressing the problem of intolerance and discrimination. And so there's a very wide range of countries within the OSCE, from Azerbaijan to Poland, where Odir is based, Russia, the US, France. And the governments within some of these 57 countries are led by people who themselves, in some cases, have risen to power on the back of a rhetoric of intolerance, be it subtle or not so subtle. And I'm wondering, how do you deal with that tension between the commitment, or some might say lip service, that governments paid to addressing this issue, and the reality, whereas in some, in some cases, these leaders are actually directly fueling the problem? Well, there are actually specific OSCE commitments encouraging political leaders specifically to refrain from any intolerant rhetoric or discourse that uh, would be discriminatory or targeting particular communities. So we always encourage every government uh, leader, every political system to ensure that they are uh, upholding those commitments and and sharing the message uh, themselves that um, that racism, xenophobia, discrimination um, on any grounds are unacceptable and, and that diverse and cohesive communities are what make nations strong and peaceful and resilient. So we, we re regularly remind uh, government uh, leaders and, and governments um, of that commitment. Um, but I would also say when we do see statements like this made by high level leaders, whether they be in politics or uh, or, or just uh, civil society leaders or business leaders, um, we are frequently told by civil society that, you know, particularly like during uh, COVID-19, for example, we've received reports uh, frequently from civil society organizations and local communities saying that the number of hate crimes that they've experienced and that they've reported to their governments has really been extreme and they're experiencing hate crimes and discrimination in a way that they have never received before. So we do see um, a correlation between some of this popular rhetoric, uh, where, which is discriminatory against a particular community and the kind of experiences that individuals and communities are having. Um, and we, of course, uh, constantly <laughs> encourage not only governments, but uh, societies at large to make sure that they are not uh, engaging in this sort of discourse and that they are responding and investigating these forms of hate crimes effectively. And that brings me to one of my last questions, which is what is it that governments can do? What is it they should be prioritizing? The top three things they can do to fight intolerance and hate crime. First of all, I would say if governments either have a hate crime law on the books or are thinking about putting one on the books, um, we can provide uh, legislative reviews or assistance in creating uh, effective language, legislative language. So please get in touch if uh, you are thinking about that. Um, number two, I would say implement our hate crime trainings for police and prosecutors in order to uh, assist um, those uh, those agencies to be able to better and more effectively address and investigate and, of course, then prosecute uh, hate crimes. And then finally, consistent messaging from high level officials that racism, xenophobia, discrimination and hate crimes on any grounds are unacceptable. And I'm going to be a bit greedy here and ask you <laughs> for three more solutions. But this time for individuals, because these are issues that concern all of us and we all have our role to play in this. So what are your top three recommendations for what individuals could be doing? Number one, I would say get to know folks from other communities. Um, as, as I mentioned, making those face-to-face in-person connections are truly what makes those societal bonds 
um, strong and create peaceful societies. Uh, number two, speak up when you hear acts of intolerance or hate crimes, which will then hopefully reduce the impunity that perpetrators feel when they are targeting often someone who is marginalized or vulnerable. And then finally, support civil society organizations who are working on peace building, refugee support, combating hate crimes, or any other issues that you might be passionate about, um, because this is the way that we are all making a difference within our communities. Thank you so much, Christy. Those are three very useful tips for us all to take away with us. I'm Jackie Dalton from Fondation Hirondelle, and in this episode, I've talked to Christy Edwards, whose work specializes in tolerance and non-discrimination with ODIR. Thank you very much. Thank you. Geneva Peacecast, produced by Interpeace and Fondation Hirondelle.